here we are, we're about to, um, this is part two, we're about to make part two of the mini sort of um, film, doco, video, whatever, of um, just going over it in more detail and showing uh, coding examples of the syntax that we covered in week two. And you've just now seen in your tutes and labs, um, just uh, to provide you with an alternate source of information, some more detail about some points, some examples of codes, and also to talk about some of the things that we didn't get up to in the lecture that you may or may not have covered in the tube. We'll cover them uh, next week, in week um, three, but you might want to know about them over the break to help you with your assignment. So let's have a little peep ahead now. Okay, what have we done? We've done the microprocessor, the upcodes, the uh, printer for the void, human versus computer point of view about what a side effect is, uh, declaring and defining of a function, Declaring is the first time it's mentioned. Defining is where you give all the details. Sometimes done together. Sometimes we put the declaration at the top and something called the function prototype so the compiler can compile the code in one pass. Um, in a part of the we wrote a function <coughs> about assignment seconds to go. Uh, we've looked at creating our own .h files. We did that part one. Um, we'll do scope now. We're looking at this thing called scope. And in the lectures already, in lecture number four, we looked at, and three, we looked at the idea of top-down design, that functions represent a top-down design approach, and that you basically create the name of the function and put a comment in saying what the function does, and that discharges your obligation to solve that problem for a little while. So your top-level function just calls a couple of second-level functions, and then you're done. And then, of course, you, one by one, put the details in each of those second-level functions, which might themselves need third-level functions and so on and so on working your way down the pyramid. Okay, so let's look at scope now. now we'll, we're going to use the code we developed in part one, which you also saw in the lecture, but now I've got it typed into Xcode, which has a, a function called uh, days to second, and a main function which uses that function, which calls that function. Here it is calling it, passing some information into it, and receiving some information out of it. Let's talk about this thing called scope. Because we'll be programming it, I think it will help us if we play some um, music. So let's, do, 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 do. let's get uh, yodeling music happening. Ah, very nice. Hope this won't distract you, but it'll certainly help us program. I'll play it quiet then. All right. Um, so we have our two function, the main function and the function it calls calls day to the function it calls called days to seconds. We could have as many other functions as we wanted, um, but at the moment let's just have the two. Now, notice that this function, the main function, occupies this area here, and we call that the body of the function, and the body of the days to seconds function is here. Inside the main function, we declare two variables, days left and seconds left. Inside this function down here, we also have two functions, the two variables with the same names. Gee, that is a bit distracting, isn't it? <laughs> I might just stop it for a minute. Um, um, we, we can play it when we're doing some coding. Okay, hang on. Um, all right, so we've got um, up, 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 these two uh, things here, seconds left, days left. Seconds left, days left. What's the relationship between these guys here? In other words, um, when I declare int days left here, the computer, or the compiler, sets up an area of memory um, and it stores an integer in that area of memory. And whenever your program talks about days left, um, the compiler knows you're talking about that piece of memory. Uh, and likewise, it sets up another piece of memory that it refers to as seconds left. Then down here we see again, in seconds left. Well, we're doing an initialization and declaration in the same line. So as to not be confusing, let's just do one thing at a time. I'll just spread that out. Like that. That'll help us when we talk about it now. It's quite fine to declare and define them together in this case. But let's spread it out. So here we have a declaration of seconds left, and here we have a declaration of seconds left. Are they talking about the same area of memory, or are they talking about different areas of memory? That's the $64,000 question. Well, the $64,000 answer is they're talking about different areas of memory. Although both of them refer to those areas by the same name, they're different. Like, for example, in my family, I have a brother called Andrew. 
and in perhaps your family, you might also have a brother called Andrew. And when talking to my parents, I might say, oh, Andrew did this today. And when you're talking to your parents, you might say, hey, Andrew did something today. But can you see, we're talking about different Andrews. We're using the same name, but in no sense are we talking about the same people. They just happen to have the same name. It's exactly the same situation here. When I'm referring to this piece of memory, I use that name. When I'm refer in, <coughs> sorry. When I'm inside the main function, when I'm with my family, and I refer to Andrew, when I refer to, say, days left, uh, seconds left, I mean this piece of memory. Oh, I moved the whole line. How can I do it? I mean this piece of memory. When you're inside your family, uh -huh, inside the function days to seconds, anything in here that refers to seconds left is referring to this piece of memory. The fact that they have the same name is utterly irrelevant. In fact, it's possibly even a bit confusing, isn't it? Because you might be tempted to think they're the same thing, but they're completely different. Now, part of the idiom of programming is that after a while, you'll get used to seeing things with the same name in different spots and knowing they're different things. But I suggest when you start, so you don't get confused, let's give everything a different name. You're not required to at all. It's irrelevant, but just to help you. So instead of seconds left, let's just call it seconds. And instead of days left, you can guess what I'm doing here. I'll call it days. Because in the same way that second is uh, declared here, the variable days, which is passed in, is sort of declared inside these curly braces. What does that mean? Well, Again, it means the compiler, or the computer at runtime, sets aside an area of memory that stores a days, and the number representing days. And that is a different piece of memory to the area, piece of memory set aside by the compiler when it reads this line and sets up a, a piece of memory. So this and this, although they hold the same value initially, because when we call the function days to seconds, as input we feed into it days left. So what it gets as input is the value of days left, but down here we call it days. It's not the same piece of memory though. It actually gets copied. So the computer sets up one piece of memory called days left, one piece of memory called days for this function, and whenever the function's called, it copies this value into this memory. So now we have two different locations in memory with the same piece of information. Now why am I stressing this fact that it copies it across rather than being the same piece of memory? Well, for a very important reason. If down here we changed the value of days, it would have no effect up here. Let me make that clear. Well, first of all, let's just compile it to um, convince ourselves that changing the names like this didn't make any difference at all to the program. Um, stop a previously running version, compile it, now it's running, and how many days to the week thing I was due? Uh, we uh, if I say one day, ta -da! okay, it works. So, um, so you can see we all work fine regardless of what we call the variables. In fact, I could call them Fred or Wilma or X or Y or whatever, and everything would still work. I've just picked names that mean something. Now, what are we going to do? Oh, yeah, let's assign a value to the days in here. It's unusual to do this. You normally don't assign values to the variables that are passed in. They're normally just considered to be inputs, and you don't have to work on them. But let's just do that for a second. Let's say... Days plus plus. Remember what that does? That increases the value of days by one. Uh, now, so if I passed a one in, by the time days gets to here, it has the value two, so it'll give us a number of seconds in two days, and then it returns seconds. Okay, seconds is returned and is sent into this variable called seconds left. The printf prints out seconds left. Let's also get it to print out the value um, of days left, so we can see that that hasn't changed. Left, but days left equals percent D. New line days left. Oop, that's a comma, a semicolon. Let's print the message out here. Let's also print it out just before we call it. Let's print it out just before we start. So you can see that. 
there's any difference. It's happened. It's not called to the function. All right, so we're going to print out the value of days left. We're going to call the function, which passes days left in. The thing that gets passed in is going to be modified in here. Yet, when the function returns and we resume execution at this line, you'll see that days left itself hasn't changed. What changed was a copy of days left locally called days in this function here. Let's run that and see that. Uh, days left is under claim. What have I done wrong? Oh, yeah. Capital problem again. Do, do. Oh, why didn't you tell me? Oh, okay. Do, do, do. Right, ran. What are things in here? How many days till task zero is or task one is due? Let's type one. Days left equals one. Calls the function. Days left equals one. But it has printed out the number of days for number of seconds for two days. You can see. So days left was one. It was passed in inside the function here. It was obviously converted to a two because that gives us twice as many seconds. Yet when the function returned and gave its value to seconds left. The value passed in didn't change. This um, sort of thing we're talking about now, this general topic is often called the scope of a variable. This variable here, days left, has the following scope. Everything from that curly bracket to... Well, actually, everything from where it's been declared to the next, to the next closing... I mean, to the closing curly bracket at that level. So. Anywhere that I've highlighted now, if you talk about days left, you mean this piece of memory. But anywhere else, if you talk about days left, it doesn't know what you're talking about. Down here, if I talked about days left, it, it can't get hold of this days left. This days left only lives, only makes sense between that bracket and that bracket. Similarly, the, the, fun, the um, value seconds, you can probably guess. What's the scope of seconds? Well, it's everything from when it's declared. Let's say that's in the curly bracket. It's actually been after it. The next line. Um, everywhere in here knows about seconds, but nowhere else knows about seconds. And that's what lets us have a variable called, um, say, seconds left down here, and a variable called seconds left up here, because each variable has different scope and they don't overlap. There's nowhere that it's ambiguous. In each spot we know exactly which one we mean. Now, the scope of days, that was the other thing we talked about, variables that are sort of declared inside the, in the brackets here. That we call them variables passed in, by the way, we call them arguments. The, um, the arguments down here... Uh, sometimes called the formal arguments, but let's just call them the arguments down here. The arguments down here, like int days, their scope is, again, just inside the function. From outside, the word days makes no sense to anyone, unless it's declared outside, in which case it makes sense, but it's talking about something else. All right. Now, I've laboured this a lot, but it's really important to understand that what's passed in is copied mysteriously, and the copy is available to the function, and when the function returns... Um, the original thing is left untouched. So the function can uh, damage the copy as much as it wants, change it, and it won't affect the um, thing up here. It's like, what's an example of that? Suppose you wanted to borrow um, my favourite CD. So I'd say, OK, I'm going to give you my favourite CD, but instead, and I would never do this because um, intellectual property is very important, um, the, the letter of it, not just the spirit, I mean, what I'm about to suggest is abhorrent, but suppose I wanted to lend you the CD, but I, I don't know, I just thought you might try and modify the CD in some way. You might lose it or scratch it or break it or write on it or do something bad. I could copy the CD and give you a copy. You see what's happening here? Then you would take the copy, you would do stuff, and you'd eventually give the copy back. And I would just throw it in the bin, smash it up, of course, so no one else can use it because it doesn't matter what you've done to it, because I've kept the original, I've only given you a copy. Does that make sense? When functions behave this way, and in C, functions do behave this way, it's called pass by copy. And pass by copy is very powerful, because it means you can give your function stuff and not worry about what they're going to do with it, because whatever they do won't make any difference. The only effect they can have on the outside world, and the rest of the program, is the thing they return. And whatever they return, gets sent here. Yeah, yeah? This returned by the function, so if you say blah equals the output of the function, then blah gets the result of the function. So we, in a sense, say the only effect that a, a function has is returning a single value. And of course, as we talked about last lecture, sometimes it has additional effects, and we call them side effects. And being a good functional programmer, if you're writing a good functional program, um, uh, which is a way of writing programs, you try not to have any side effects. You try and have your functions only affecting the world through the thing they return. Now, if you've been paying attention, I 
but you're thinking, but hang on, scan if doesn't behave like that. Just think about that for a second while I'm slowly highlighting it. Oh, in fact, while you're thinking about it, why don't we play some music? Here we go. Oh, that's good thinking music, isn't it? What's going on with scan if? Think about it. We pass in, we declare days left up here. We pass days left in, which means we're just passing rubbish in. Yet somehow, miraculously, after scan hef has run, oh, that is excellent, exciting thinking music, isn't it? Um, after scan hef has run, uh, the the days left variable up here has a new value in it. In other words, running scan f changed days left. In other words, somehow scan f was able to modify the thing we passed in. Isn't that crazy? It seems to contradict everything I've said, and that works because of the ampersand, and that's that's the reason the ampersand is there. I still haven't explained why it works. Yeah, remember I promised that it's coming in week four, but now at least you know a bit more about the ampersand. Putting an ampersand there means the function is able to modify this variable. Okay, so that's how scanf works. It's an odd way of doing uh, scanf. You might wonder why they just didn't return the value, um, and that's a good question that we'll address later. Okay, so we've now looked at scope. Let's just go back to here. We've looked at scope, top down design, and we'll have a little pause to listen to this beautiful music, and we'll return and we'll write um, another set of functions, uh, and we'll introduce the world of wondrous numbers. Uh, and, uh, and that's the example we're going to use to explain recursion. See you in a second. <laughs>